My Identity in Christ Church. Our church vision is to establish Christ at the center of people's lives. We will accomplish this goal through our church mission initiatives, which is to teach people how to discover their purpose and fulfill it. Discover their identity in Christ and embrace it. Build godly relationships and marriages that glorify God on the earth. This is what success looks like to us. Seeing people walking in their identity, seeing people living a life of purpose, having Christ-centered relationships. This is what success looks like to us. We see a church that helps you to be more Christ-like at work. We see a church that helps you to be more Christ-like in your families. We see a church that teaches you, disciples you on how to develop a closer intimacy with God. We see a church that helps you and encourages you to develop your gifts and talents. Our goal as a church is to have impacted the lives of one million people by the 31st of December 2030. My identity in Christ Church is not just a place where people gather. This is a church that's on the move to disciple people and see Jesus Christ at the center of everything they do and experience in their lives. For more information and on how you can be part of this vision, please feel free to leave a message. Your holiness, oh, 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 
we bless your name, your holy name. 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 You are, you are, you are. You are a covenant keeping God. You are the covenant keeping God. You are the covenant keeping God. You are a covenant keeping God. Oh, you are a keeping God. Yes, you are. You are a covenant keeping God. Oh, you are a covenant keeping God. You are a covenant keeping God. You are, you are, I have a nothing What an honor it is to work. What an honor it is to know your name. We sing Yahweh. 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 Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. Sing Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh,
We give you the glory. Yes, you are. Oh, only you, you are 
joy of the new day. Just keep 
in the time of worship and praise I wanted to just read the scripture that I was going to read for the prayer for this morning to you and then we'll continue a little bit more worship and then we'll go into the word so Joshua chapter 2 verse 8 I'm going to read from the Amplified Classic and it says before the two men had lain down Rahab came up to them on the roof and she said to the men I know that the Lord has given you the land and that your terror is falling upon us. And all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of Amorites who were on the east side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, who you utterly destroyed. When we, heard, when we heard it, our hearts melted. Neither the spirit or courage remain any more in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Joshua chapter 2 verse 8 to 11. And I think I've shared this before a very, very long time, probably a couple of years ago, um, when we talk about the children of Israel just in prayer about how God stands for the children of Israel and rescues the children of Israel in times of challenge. But what was really interesting in this um, narrative, for some of you who remember how Jericho was destroyed, that when they walked around the walls of Jericho, God gave them a specific instruction of how they were going to destroy Jericho. And in Joshua chapter 1, God had passed on the mantle from Moses to Joshua and said, Joshua, be strong and be courageous. But what's really interesting about this scripture is that when they went to spy on the land, This is not the first time they spy on the land. Remember, the first time they went to spy on the land, Moses sent out 12 men, one person from each tribe, and 10 of them came with a terrible report. We were like grasshoppers. We're going to die in front of the people. And only two people, Joshua and Caleb, came with a positive report. And because they didn't believe God, for 40 years, God waited until that generation died so that the new generation that was under 20 at the time would then rise up. And this was the generation now that we're getting ready to go and conquer Jericho. And so in Joshua chapter 2, when they go and they eventually go into Jericho to scout out the land for a second time, they meet Rahab. So imagine once upon a time when we went the first time, we thought we were grasshoppers. We weren't courageous enough. We went, we didn't believe, we didn't have the faith we needed. But the second time we went and the enemy or someone from the enemy's camp, I know Rahab eventually becomes in the lineage of Jesus, but for this minute, she's representing the enemy. The enemy is telling you, we have been afraid of you since time began. Like we have been afraid of you from a long time ago. We have been afraid of you because of what was done in Egypt. Even before you came to spy on us the first time. Remember, she doesn't know about the first spying, but we have been afraid of you. Who is it that's rising up against you that you are afraid of because you think they are more powerful than your God? Who is it that is rising up against you, speaking against you, making false witness against you, making your life difficult that you're thinking they're going to be able to overpower me, but you're not realizing that your God is bigger than that person. And sometimes you don't know. It's because the devil knows. Why do you think the devil went to Eve? You know, we focus too much on Adam and Eve and the woman and da-da-da. 
because the devil knew what God was trying to do. He did that because he knew the potential would be what we're experiencing today, that there will be famine in the world, that there will be death, that there will be all of these different things in the world. So he knew all of that, which is the reason why he made the effort to go and speak to Eve and then start everything that we can see today, because he knew the devil is more afraid. He is afraid because he knows the end for him is judgment. God has already declared judgment on the devil. I, I met some people who said they were praying for the devil. I was like, why? Weirdest thing. Like, why? <laughs> because God has already declared judgment. If it was a case of God was still waiting, you know, go and speak to Nineveh so that if they hear the word, maybe they might turn. Yes. But God has already declared judgment in this situation. It's done. And it's not a man that he would lie or change or revert from his word. God is not up and down. It's declared judgment. So the devil already knew how powerful we could be. He knew that can you believe God made them in his image? That's even higher than angels. He says, made them a little bit lower than angels in the Psalms. Another scripture says, we ourselves, we even judge angels. It was us that God made in his own image. So the enemy knew. So he orchestrated this whole thing so that we could lose what we had. Sometimes some of the challenges you're going through, especially when you know God has given you a word for a breakthrough, is because the enemy knows what you have. And I believe God just allowed them to hear this from Rahab for reassurance. This is what all this was, for reassurance, to say that time when you were in the wilderness and you just would not believe, we were already scared of you. So they could have conquered this land 40 years ago. Half the battle is in the mind. They could have conquered this land 40 years ago. They had to wait for a whole generation who had the right mindset. Pastor Shay has been talking about biblical worldview to come in. What is the worldview of defeat that you are holding on to because you're looking at your circumstances and you're judging it much more powerful or bigger than God? What is that circumstance? What is that situation that you are looking at and you're saying, this one, I can't, this one's going to beat me. This one's going to destroy me. This one's going to, that person's going to get away with it. What is it that you are looking at? And the enemy is saying, yeah, it's true. It's true. That person's going to get you. And it's a massive, massive lie. If you could see in the camp of the enemy how scared they are, how afraid they are. And you know all the devil's trying to do right now is if I can just get as many people in hell as possible. The devil's not trying to restore and that. No, no. Let me just get as many people in hell as possible. Let me just make people's lives um, uncomfortable. Disease is that you lose your ease. That's why he put sickness, so that people have dis-ease. You lose your ease. It's not there just to kind of kill you, then it's done. It's just making you uncomfortable. That's why you've got that neck pain, that backache, that leg ache, whatever it is. That's why somebody, now you're having to spend time in hospital. He's trying to put dis-ease in you. That's why you have to speak against it quickly. You don't take it. Just because you're sick, you don't take it. You, you speak against you. You pray against you. You ask yourself to be anointed. Because why do I want something that's diseasing in my body, my life? Why do I want it? It puts disease in other ways, in our minds, in our workplaces, with our relationship. Let me put disease there. So I just want us just to, as we're continuing the time of worship, and then we'll pass on to Pastor Shay. <laughs> I just want us just to be encouraged. The Bible says in verse 9, um, Rahab said, and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and your terror is falling upon us. The devil knows that healing is yours. He knows that divine help is yours. He knows that provision is yours. He knows that peace is yours. He knows that love is yours. He knows that good, healthy relationships is yours. He knows that provision is yours. So he already knows all of that. And because of that, he wouldn't even be wasting his time with you if there wasn't terror in the camp of the enemy. That if we don't do something, this person, look what he said about Job. See, you're protecting him. That's why no one can touch him. He knows God is watching over you. He knows his eyes is over you like a sparrow. He's aware of that. And the Bible also says here that your terror is falling upon us and all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Verse 11, when we heard it, what God has done for you before, our hearts melted. The devil's heart melted. Look at Job. I can't even touch him. I can't even be bothered to touch him. Because you won't even allow me. That's how he's looking at you in front of the presence of God. Is that I can't even touch Raz because this is a beloved of God. Even more so, I can't even touch Raz because every time I see Raz, I am seeing Jesus. That's who he's seeing, Jesus. But yet we, 
we don't believe it, we walk away from it and we get a different mindset and then we allow him to creep in, to creep in. And all he has to do is distort our mindset. That's all he has to do. So as we continue in the time of worship today, verse 11 says, when we heard it, our hearts melted. Neither did spirit or courage remain anymore in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. I want that to be our truth today. That there is no power on this earth, in the heavens, anywhere that they might be, that's ever going to be above or greater than your God who is in heaven or your God who is on this earth beneath the heavens. So let's continue in our time of worship and I will invite Pastor Shay just to give us the word. You 
Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Please take your seats. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to come before you, to worship you, to praise your holy name, for you deserve all the worship. Lord, we come before you today. Lord, we pray, be with us. Speak to us. Make yourself real to us today. Lord, take control of my vocal cords. None of me, all of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Good morning, church. I'm so excited today to continue with the 
teaching series for the month of uh, April. We'll be looking at a subject matter, how to develop a biblical worldview. And this is such an important subject for us believers because it is something that really pertains more to us than it does to non-believers. Because as an unbeliever, you cannot even develop a biblical worldview because you don't have it in the first place. What the Bible tells us that the things of the spirit goes with the spirit and the things of the flesh goes with the flesh. So you need to be a man and woman of the spirit. You need to belong to the spirit before you can even start to develop in the things of the spirit. It's like being a citizen of the United Kingdom. I was born in this country, which means I'm entitled to certain things in comparison to somebody who was not born here. They are not entitled to certain things. They need to, first of all, be a citizen. So you need to be a citizen of the kingdom of God before you can start to develop and grow in the things of God. I once heard a man of God made a very profound statement that really resonated with me. And he said this, he said, you might belong to the local church, but you belong to the church in heaven. You might belong to the local church, but you belong to the church in heaven, because that's what matters. That's what matters. Somebody wants to say, if God is love, why wouldn't he just let everybody go to heaven? My question to you is this. Would you let a beggar enter your house? Somebody dressed in filth, covered in mud, covered in dirt. Would you say, come on in, sit on my nice, lovely sofa? Let's be honest. So why would you expect a righteous and holy God to entertain sin? Somebody once said, you need to know the Lord of the work before you can do the work of the Lord. A lot of us are zealous for God, use me. God, use me. I'm available, God. Use me. But you know the Lord of the work. Because you must know the Lord of the work before you can do the work of the Lord. And the difference is having a biblical worldview. So I want to start today very quickly as we expand on this subject. We're looking at part two of this series. And this is found in the book of uh, Ezekiel, This, which is where I'm going to start my reading from. Ezekiel chapter 28, we see a clear description of the consequences of not having a biblical worldview. And God is so gracious and merciful that he's gone the extra mile to show us the benefits of having a biblical worldview. God is the only person I know that is consistent in making sure he explains to you and I why we should do something. God is not going to say, just do this for the sake of it. He will explain to you or will give you some kind of inclination as to why you ought to do it. So I want to encourage us today, as we are hearing what God has to say, as God is ministering to us, to take a look at your life. I'm taking a look at my life to see where there are gaps. Because when you don't know, you don't know. But guess what? When you know, you're now accountable before God. And the day is coming when we are all going to stand before God to give accounts for our life. You will stand before God eyeball to eyeball. Your father will not be there. Your mother will not be there because they have their own appointments. You know, and you will stand before God and give an account. Books, the Bible says books will be open and you'll be judged based on what is in the book. Let me translate that to modern day society, which you can relate to. There will be a presentation, slide one, when you were born. Slide two when you had your first uh, steps as a baby. Slide three, you went to school. Slide four, when you cuss off the bus driver. Give accounts for your life. And you, but God, I, I, no, no, you can't even say, God, I didn't do that because you're looking at it real time. It's playback. Only fools argue with proof, right? So if you're looking at it, you can't argue with God. So God would judge each and every one of us. And notice, this is a judgment for believers, forget about unbelievers, they're already doomed. This is believers. God is judging us on that day to determine what reward you will qualify for. Give an account for your life. And the person that's going to judge us is Jesus Christ. God has given Christ Jesus the delegation for that duty. So it's not God Almighty that's going to judge us at the judgment seat of Christ. It's Jesus Christ our Lord. What a better person. Who's better than Jesus to judge us? He died for us. Hallelujah. So I want you to take this very seriously as we go deeper into this. Ezekiel chapter 28. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 18 and read. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, 
This is what the Lord God says. Because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasures. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God? But you shall be a man and not a God. In the hand of him who slays you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. Notice the scripture is showing us a picture of a real life king that once upon a time existed. It's called the king of Ty. King of Ty was a man who ruled over the kingdom of Ty during the time of prophet Ezekiel. And he was a very greedy king. He was a very undermining king was a king who subdued people and who just treated people badly. What comes to mind when I think of the king of Thai is what recently happened not too long ago. I'm sure some of you might have watched the documentary of it. Uh, the Windrush generation, where people came from abroad into the UK, helped to build the economy, helped to build civilization, and all of a sudden, they're showing them the door. You know, that's equivalent to what the king of Thai was doing. People built the kingdom with their resources, labor, and all manner of things. But in the end, the king of Thai took credit for it. In the end, he didn't value what he had done. In the end, he was indirectly saying, that's the door if you don't do things my way, basically. And God was not happy about it. Because the Bible says a laborer is worthy of his wages. And then, the interesting thing we see about the king of Thai, as wicked as the king was, there is a picture and a lesson for us to learn about the king of Thai. Because God is a God who uses examples in scripture to teach us something. And if you look at verse 11 to 18, we're going to see a little bit more meaning in this text. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Thai and say to him, this is what the Lord says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sagittarius, topaz, and diamond beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, so tok and tokies, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbers and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Notice what the word the Bible says there. On the day you were created. God is talking about a created being. Okay? On the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers, meaning he was, God is talking about the devil here, and he said you were the anointed cherub, meaning you were an angel who guard the throne of God. In the throne of God, you've got, let's say this is the throne of God. You've got a cherub there, and you've got another cherub there, and you've got a massive cherub at the back of God. So imagine God sitting down in a chair, and you've got a cherub on the back of God with his wings stretched out, covering the throne. That's the position the devil had before he fell. You were an anointed chair who covers. I establish you. This is God speaking. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fairy stones. The fairy stones are the stars. The devil walked on stars. I know we can't imagine that, but it, it happened. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fairy stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. I love the emphasis. God is saying you were a created being. Till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence. By the abundance of your trading, is referring to by the things you accomplished. The influence you had, you were 
lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. I mentioned this last week that when we read in the Bible, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yes, that's what the Bible says in Genesis. But before God said, let there be light, and there was light, there were, hum not human beings, there were living beings, life form on the planet before we came along. We're not the first living beings on the planet. There were other living beings. The Bible doesn't give us any more description about them, but we know one thing about them. They were living beings. They had intelligence, and the Bible called them kings. So they had status. They were called kings. That is why when the Bible says the devil was thrown out of heaven, and the next thing the angels said was, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. It's not talking about you and me because we had not come along at the time. For the great dragon has fallen with great wrath. Woe to the inhabitants. So he was saying, look, the devil's been kicked out of heaven. He's on his way down to earth. And I feel sorry for you guys. Not human beings, but the living beings. And guess what happened? When the devil landed on earth, he landed like a meteorite. You will know what that looks like. It crashed the place. It's like a missile hitting a spot. It crashed the place. So when the Bible said, let it be light, there was light. That was a recreation. That was not a creation taking place. It was a recreation because God is a God of order. God does not create things in disorder. Does that make sense? He's a God of order. And the, the, um, the, Jesus Christ, our Lord, said something very powerful. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And you know when lightning hits the place, <laughs> that place is going to be destroyed. So I'm saying all of this to give you a picture in what we're hearing here. He said, I cast you to the ground. What ground? The earth. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Who were gazing at the devil? Those who were living on the earth at the time. They were looking at him like, what happened to this guy? We heard about you, but is this the guy who caused so much problem in heaven? Is this, you mean this little guy who knocked that world champion out? Really? You know, you're shocked. Like, you look at him like, what's so special about it? That's how much God reduced the devil. That's what God reduced the devil to from what he was. From a cherub that covers in the throne of God, the highest ranking angel. There was no angel higher than the devil. Not even Michael, not even Gabriel. To becoming somebody that, somebody on the earth would look at you and say, who's this, who's this guy? That's how low he sunk. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. No, not in the word. Multitude of iniquities. There were several iniquities in his heart. By the multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. Oof. You know, it's one thing to be on fire. It's nothing to be consumed by fire from inside out. So the devil was disfigured by God, not by God throwing fire at him. God caused fire from within him to burn him from inside outward. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples were astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Meaning, where, how you were created, you're not going to return to that state ever again. I've debased you. I've humbled you. And the interesting thing we see in this story is that the king of Ty, that we read in Ezekiel 28, verse 1 to 10, was a real human king that governed a particular town, country, city, right? But notice the similarity between the devil and the king of Tyre. Number one, the Bible is giving us the similarities, the comparison between the king of Tyre and the devil, also known and called the king of Tyre. For one reason. God is showing us that behind every human authority, behind every human governorship, there is a principality. The question is not whether there is a principality. The question is what type of principality is there? God is a principality. The devil is a principality. God has thrones. The devil has thrones. Whatever the devil, God has, the devil has a counterfeit. So 
we see in this text that it was the devil who was behind the doings of the king of time. That's why the Bible likened the devil to the king of time. What the scripture is showing us here is that what we're seeing in the natural, the wicked things the king of time was doing, yes, we're seeing that in the natural. And we say that king is wicked. But God is saying, yes, I can understand why you're saying he's wicked, but let me show you who's behind him. The king of time was just a puppet on a string. The devil was the real person pulling the strings behind the scenes. So God was showing us there's a king that you can see, and there's a king that you cannot see, and they're both called the king of time. Hallelujah, glory to God. So it's not necessarily the king that's wearing the crown that runs the show. Sometimes the king that's running the show that's not wearing the crown, and that was the devil. And notice what they had in common. They both had pride in their life. What brought the king of Ty down? Pride. What brought the devil down? Pride. And the God is showing us in this scripture here something for us to learn. Number one, the human king was the puppet whose strings were being pulled by the unseen king of Ty, which is the devil. The scripture also shows us that the unseen king was really the, the one in charge, not the human king. So the question we've got to ask ourselves then is, what allowed the king of Ty to be the way he was. Well, the unseen king entered him. The unseen king was ruling him. But what enabled the unseen king of Ty to rule the, uh, the earthly king of Ty? Very simple. P-R-I-D-E. Pride. The Bible said pride goes before destruction. We see that in the life of Lucifer. We see that in the life of the earthly king of Ty. What led to the downfall of the unseen king of Ty? Pride. So there's a lesson for us to learn here. Behind every governing authority, it doesn't matter what, that, what authority is, it might be authority at work, church, anywhere there's authority. Guess what? There is a principality in the unseen realm that is influencing that person. In a church setting, there is a influence. Me as a pastor, there is some a principality influencing me by God's grace is, the, is God, not the devil. And you could tell from the doctrine you hear. Because the devil can only produce evil. You can only fake things for a short time. When you look at the longevity of, of a person's life, what they produce will tell you what's behind them. Now, let's go to the book of Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. There's something I want you to see here. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 6. Look what the Bible says. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Meaning every authority we see was behind it. Who created it? God. Just because God created the authority does not mean it's, dis uh, it's dispensed in the way God wants it to be dispensed. So God might make you a president of a nation, or God might, created, or God might have created the office called the presidency and wants somebody to fill it. But you could end up filling it and not do it right by God. God cannot force you to do right by God. He can only influence you. And you have to yield to him or yield to the devil. But nonetheless, that office was created by God. So just because you have a president who's doing something wrong does not mean God is doing something wrong. The office is what God created. The person in the office can either yield to be led by God, yield to be led by the devil. You choose. He said, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to God's works, to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good. And you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you to, for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for, the, for, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs are due. Fear to whom fear is due. Honor to whom honor is due. God is saying, just because you don't like 
the prime minister doesn't mean she find a way to dodge paying taxes. Just because they are not a believer still doesn't mean you don't obey the law because the authority was established by God. And if you justify, but I don't like the way that person is running the show, I'm not going to do it. You're resisting God. And guess what? You're not going to win. You're not going to win that match. So God is saying we must be subject to every authority. The only thing we can do if we're not happy with an authority, which God sanctions, if you're not happy, for let's say you're working in a company, for example, and your boss is mean and horrible and all of these nasty things, and you're not happy with the authority of your boss, the only thing you can do is leave the company. But as long as you stay in the company, you have to submit to the authority. Because to not do so is to be fighting against God himself. Very clear in scripture. It's not about, oh, he's not a believer. God doesn't care about that. The moment you're under authority, you submit to the authority. And if you're not happy to submit to the authority, remove yourself from that authority. Because if you're under the authority and you're not submitting to the authority, what, what you're doing is you're contending with God. And it's, hard to, it's a hard pill to swallow. But God is so mercy and gracious that gives us your way of escape. Remove yourself. It doesn't matter whether it's a job situation, any situation where you're under authority, if you're not happy with the leadership and you feel like there's, conf there's a conflict that you, you just can't bear it, uh, can't stand it, don't, by staying and rebelling is worse. Best thing you can do is remove yourself. This is what the Bible teaches. So, now, let's read on. To show you again what I mean by there being a principality behind every authority, I want to show you something very powerful here. That's why when I see the news sometimes, I just laugh when I see some of the things that's been reported in the media. You know, but I can't blame them because they don't know the word. They're not Christians, most of them, so you can't really blame them for not knowing what they don't know. But I want to show you something very powerful in Scripture that would really go a long way to emphasize what I'm trying to convey to you today. And this is found in the book of uh, Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Look what the Bible says. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Who, who are the sons of his people? The Jewish people. Who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. And everyone who's found written in the book. Notice what the Bible is saying. God is saying, there will come a time where Israel will be under heavy persecution, will be under heavy attack. But despite the attack, whoever's attacking them is, is, a, is a lost battle. Because there's a principality behind Israel. No, I'm not talking about the president of Israel. I'm talking about the office. I'm talking about the people of Israel, the Jewish people in particular. So where the Jewish people are in danger of being eradicated, never mind what the government is doing, God will judge the government for wrongdoings. God will discipline those who need to be disciplined. Don't get me wrong. But I'm talking about the Jewish people. Whenever the Jewish people are under attack, under heavy persecution, Angel Michael is on standby to deliver them and fight for them. Very clear in scripture. So fighting against the Jewish people is suicide. It's what I call spiritual suicide. Because it's a battle you will never win. And I'm not condoning some negative things the government of Israel has done. I'm not condoning that. But nonetheless, the Jewish people are a protected people by God. And God made it very clear that I will judge them for the wrongdoings they've done. But for my name's sake, for my, not, for their, not because of their behavior, for my name's sake, I will protect them. I will discipline them and I'll also protect them. God made it very clear in scripture. I'm saying this to show you that God has appointed Angel Michael for that task. So when you see things happen, you think, ah, come, no matter what happens against people, they're still standing. This happened. They're still standing. Do you know how many things have gone through and they're still standing? Why? Because there's a principality that is ruling behind the scenes. Same way in the king of Thai, there was a principality ruling behind the scenes called the devil. So it's an important thing for us to, to pay attention to. Now, I want to show you something very interesting here. Let's go to Daniel chapter 4. 
Daniel chapter 4. Uh, let me just pull it up very quickly. Daniel chapter 4. Uh, my phone's playing up. Just bear with me a second. Yeah, Daniel chapter 4. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 37. Look what the Bible says. We're talking about developing the biblical worldview. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all peoples, nation and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked in me. So this is King Nebuchadnezzar sharing the story in hindsight to us. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts in my, on my bed and the vision of, of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me. That they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at, but at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him, the Spirit of God dwells. And I told him the dream before him, saying, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the Spirit of the Lord God is in you, and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and give me its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while I was on my bed. I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth, its leaves were lovely, its fruits abundant, and, in it, and, and inside it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the vision of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher. A watcher means an angel. There was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said, chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him gaze and let him gra and graze with the beast on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers, i.e. the angels, and the sentence by the word of the Holy One, i.e. God, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and he gives to whoever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. So God is saying the dream that was given to King Nebuchadnezzar, was God's way of explaining who is working behind the scenes. You might think all of the things you're doing is all about you, you and I. But God is saying, as much as you might think it is, let me tell you something, there's something behind the scene that you just cannot see. So it's giving them a picture here. Now look what happened next. The dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen, now you, Belshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the Holy One is in you. Now let's look what Daniel has to say. Verse, 15, verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream of its interpretation trouble you. Belshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you. 
Because he, he was troubled because he knew what the meaning of the dream was. And he was thinking, how, how can I tell this king, this great king, this, how can I tell him this? It's like a woman breaking up with a man. It's like, what do I begin? It's not you, it's me. He said, my Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and his interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all of the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruits abundant, in which was food for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and riches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, i.e. an angel, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over. This is the interpretation. O king, and this is the decree of the most high which has come upon my lord the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall, they shall wet you with the dew of heaven. And seven times, meaning seven years, shall pass over you. Till you know the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he chooses. Till you know the most high rules. Well, I, what was God saying that? God was saying that because King Nebuchadnezzar had a earthly worldview. And God is saying the way you're going is not going to end well because you have an earthly worldview. Whenever we hold on to earthly worldview, guess what? The future is not bright and the future is not orange. We need to shift from an earthly worldview. And God is, and I love the mercy of God. Sometimes we say, God, why did God want this man? Very vividly, very clear. The way you're going is not the way. The Bible says there's a way that leads, there's a way that's, um, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to destruction. Earthly worldview. And God gave him a fantastic dream. And not only that, interpretation of the dream. Had God given him the dream without interpretation, we'd say, oh, after all, God, you know, he didn't understand what he meant. He knew what he meant. And God said, the reason why I'm giving you this dream is because I want you to change your worldview. Because right now you don't think the most high God rules in the face of man. But he does. But he does. But the Bible says, the devil is the God of this world. Yes, that doesn't change the fact that God rules in the face of man. What that means is basically, the devil is the God of this world. Meaning, the devil is who the unsaved are following. The unsaved are worshipping. But those who surrender to God, he can intervene on their behalf. He can stand in the gap for them. He can intervene. So just because the devil rules this world does not mean God cannot step in there and intervene. That's what God is saying. Yes, we know the devil rules because everyone who's not saved is following the devil, whether they know it or not. But when we have a few or some following God, I can put my foot on the door and intervene. But you, Nebuchadnezzar, because of your accomplishments, because of your wealth, because you're seen on the earthly realm as a great king who conquered kings, because of your accomplishments, you've achieved so much. Every nation is scared of you. You're like the America of today, the most powerful nation. And you think you made it happen? Oh, no. No, sir. No, you didn't. You think you woke up one day and just became great like that? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You're just a man. You're just a man. And look what happens next. In verse 26, And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots on the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you. Meaning, you're not going to lose your kingdom. After you come to know that heaven rules. Verse 27, therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous. What's the remedy to your situation? 
Righteous. Be righteous. What's my state right now? Unrighteous. Break off your sins by being righteous. And your iniquities. Notice that iniquity and righteousness are two different things. Sin is contravening the word of God. Going against the will of God. That's sin at a very basic level. Iniquity are peculiar sins to you and I. So let's say, for example, God says lying is a sin. That's basic knowledge. It's a sin. But peculiar sins are like, there's some things that you love doing that maybe it's a habit or something that God's been telling you, let go of that thing. Oh, no, you're struggling with it. You don't want to let go. That's a sin that's peculiar to you. It's like, the best way, to, the best way I would use to describe it is we all have tendencies in certain areas. So your tendencies that are not in line with the will of God for your life are your iniquities. And God is showing this man, not only are you not righteous, are you not living right, you have tendencies. What's his tendency? Pride. That was his own issue. What was the Satan's tendency? Pride. King of Tyre, what was his tendency? Pride. And he says, break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. What did the king of Tyre do? He did not show mercy to the poor. It's like the Windrush generation. Everybody forgot about them. Now that the country is established and wealthy and doing well, they set them aside. That's no mercy. That's why people went, go angry. You know, it was a few years back now when that happened. They go, hey, what's going on? We did this. We built this whole country. Because now you're trying to deport them? That's not merciful. So God is saying to him, turn away from your unrighteous acts. Turn away from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. I love what God does. God did not only tell him you're doing wrong. God told him what he's doing. God gave him the solution to correcting it. Powerful. Most human beings don't do that. You filled your test. Okay, do it again. What? Oh, okay, what, what did I go wrong? I don't know. Do it again. That's what happens with tests, isn't it? You fill your driving test. Do it again. When the, does it come and tell you, okay, well, I'm going to test you now. If you store, I'm going to fail you. Let's do it again. No, it doesn't. If you store, you get failed. Simple. But well, God tells you where you went wrong, and he tells you how to fix it. That's the mercy of God. So notice what happened here. Turn away, from your, um, turn away from your unrighteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a, length, a lengthening of your prosperity. So God is saying at this point, the way you're going, your prosperity is limited. I've drawn a line under the sand. That this, you're, gonna go, you're not going to go past this level. But if you turn, I can increase it. So there's a lot of incentive for this man. Let me show you how wicked pride is. Let's go on. Verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, this was 12 months later after the dream, after the interpretation, he had forgotten about it. Maybe he was scared for one month, scared for two months. Umbu. Oh, can I help you? Oh, it's maybe went food bank for two months. And then one day he woke up. Maybe he just conquered another kingdom. He woke up, forgot about all of the lessons, like we all do sometimes. Forget about what God's one is about. We forget. We get comfortable. There's no stress. There's no struggle. Look what happened. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, It's not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling, but my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. Notice in verse 20, 31. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times, i.e. seven years, shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of man and gives it to whoever it chooses. That very hour, not in, it wasn't like a one month's notice. You want to pick the tenant, one month's notice, I'm kicking you out. That very hour, that very hour, there was no more grace for this man. That very hour, 
That's what the Bible says. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagles. He had, he looked like an eagle. He had the feathers of eagles. A human being. Feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Instantly, in that hour, when that word was spoken, he hadn't finished saying, I am mighty. I said, look at what I've, I've accomplished. Look at what I've done. I'm so great. Just transform us. <laughs> That's literally what happened to him. He was the first transformer. You know, they copied it from the Bible. <laughs> Don't let them fool you. These unbelievers, they, they read the Bible. Imagine, the, I, can, I can understand why the people must have driven him out. Because it's shocking to see a whole king all of a sudden transform before your eyes. Of course you drive him out. His body was covered with feathers, like an eagle. He, God gave him the heart of a beast. He was acting like an animal. He ate grass for seven years. The whole king. The whole the nations around him were scared of. He, I can't even imagine that. This was not somebody being forced to eat grass. He ate it like it was real food. It's like you go to McDonald's and say, can I can have a cheeseburger. He's running around. Grass, grass, grass. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so look what happens here. And at the end of the days, in Nebuchadnezzar lifted up my eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned unto me. What does it mean to lift my eyes unto heaven? He humbled himself. And I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored him that liveth forever. Oh, you didn't know he lived it forever before? After eating grass, I did. <laughs> And I honor him and that lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And it does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What thou hast do. At that time, at that same time, my understanding returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established back into my kingdom. And excellent greatness was added to me. And the part I want you to pay close attention to is, is verse 37. In verse 37 it says this. Now, after all of this has happened, I, Nebuchadnezzar, have a biblical worldview. And we're about to be introduced to what our worldview is. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the King of Heaven, for all His works are true. For all His works are true. What works? Making me eat grass for seven years are true. Making me look like an eagle was the right thing to do. Banishing me from my kingdom, as horrible as it was, was the right thing to do. Do you know what it takes for you to say that your difficulty, your challenge was God did the right thing? How many of us can say some of the pain we've gone through, like, he did the right thing? It's when you come to your senses. It's when, that's proof that you've humbled yourself. For you to look at the pain you went through and say, you know what? God, God is so clever. It's a good thing God let me go through that. You know something has changed. He said, all these works are true. Another translation says it like this. Everything he does is right. Can you look at your, the areas of your pain and say, everything God has done is right? Can you look at the times when you were acting silly, disobeying God, living waywardly, and God allowed certain things to happen to you? Can you look back and say, everything he does is right? What will make you say that? A biblical worldview. A biblical worldview. Nebuchadnezzar was a great king. Let's not, let's not, let's not forget that. He was a great king. He was the only king that every king feared. In, it's like in our day, he was the king with the most weapons of mass destruction. So he was respected. But look what God reduced him to. With all your weapons of mass destruction, you're no better than a goat. Goats were his brethren for seven years. <laughs> That's literally, goats were his brethren for seven years. Nebu, nebu, nebu. So, 
I'm showing you all of this because when we don't have a biblical worldview, there's only one destination, and it's down. You might coast for a long time, and we deceive ourselves by measuring the fact that things are going well for a long time. It takes six months on average to build a house. It takes one day to cremate it. It takes six months to build a house on average, one day to cremate it. It takes nine months to produce a baby. It takes one day to abort it. It's always easier to cremate than it is to create. Nebuchadnezzar spent years building this majestic kingdom, building this reputation as king of kings. One word from God reduced him to a common animal so that you can know that God indeed, even though you don't see it all the time, rules in the affairs of man. When we have a biblical worldview, we don't big up our chests. We don't walk around like we're the best in sliced bread. We don't have the mindset that because God blessed me or God used me to be a blessing to somebody else, I'm special. No, you're not. If God didn't use you, you can use somebody else. He said, if you won't praise me, I'll raise up stones to praise me. It is a privilege for God to use me and use you to be a blessing to people. Me being a minister of God, preaching the word to you, it is a privilege. It's a privilege because God could use anybody. What's special about me for God to say, Pastor Shea, you're the only one that can deliver this message? That's a lie. It's a lie. Only, the only thing that will make me say that is pride. Nobody, it doesn't matter your status, it doesn't matter your background. If God is using you, it is a privilege. God blessing me, it is a privilege. God saving me is a privilege. What did we do for God to stop and save us? What? Tell me one thing that you did. What's so special about you? Oh, you know, I got a good vibe. Huh? Huh? Vibe? Vibe? Oh, I've got good dress sense. Huh? What, what, what do we have that will make God say, wow, let me, let, me, let me pull over? Let's be honest. So what are we prideful of? What are we prideful of? I got a million pounds in my account. Okay, so what's that going to do for God? I'm gorgeous. Uh, have you seen what people say about angels? Let me tell you, Sodom and Gomorrah, they wanted to sleep with angels. But they were beautiful. So, what, okay, I'm gorgeous. Who made you gorgeous? Wasn't it God? So what do we have, really? Really, what do if I wish there was something we could say? I understand why people pray for what do we have that we can stand for God and say, Yeah, I'm something. Pride is a spiritual cancer, and it only brings you down. And the way up in the kingdom of God is down. The way up in the kingdom of God is down. King Nebuchadnezzar learned it the hard way, and it was not God's plan for him to learn it the hard way, but he did not listen. God was saying, change, change, change. He did not listen. So when God acts sovereignly, it's not because he's wicked. Your time has passed. God is patient. He said, the Bible said God is patient. He's long-suffering because he doesn't want anybody to perish. But there come a time when he will act. The Bible says he has appointed a time. We don't know what a time. God has appointed a time to judge the whole world. But in the meantime, he's being patient. So we cannot blame God. King Nebuchadnezzar went from a man who felt was like the best thing that God ever created to everything he does is right. Let, let it not be said that we have to go through some stuff to come to this revelation. Because God will always forgive you of your sins, but will not always save you from the consequences of your sin. Oh, but God, I, I'm a Christian. Why am I still going to prison? Well, you stole. That's why. You stole, you broke in somebody's house, so you've been sentenced to prison. But I, I, I gave my life to Christ. Yes, you're a safe prisoner. You still serve your sentence. Because the wages of sin is death. Sin has wages in this life and in the next life. So, let's move on. So, I want to share quickly, very quickly, the time, the hindrances to biblical worldview. Because once we can know what those hindrances are, we can know what to do to shy away from them. One of, we've already talked about one of them, which is pride. King of Thai was a whole king, went down, pride. Satan, greatest and the most important angel. It was an, let's not forget, the devil was an archangel. 
and they're not many archangels in heaven. Right now, there's only one, two, Michael and Gabriel. So before that, it was like a, it was a, above them. Where is it now? Down. What led to that? Pride. Pride. Imagine being kicked out of heaven and you're not roaming on earth. Do you know how humiliating that is? Because we can't imagine it because we've not been to heaven. But if you've been to heaven, you, you understand why it's mad. It's like living in a five-bedroom detached house and now you're living in a room. It, it, it'll play on your mind. So what are the hindrances to a biblical worldview? Let's go to, before we read the scripture, I want to say the first thing is covetousness. And this is something that we believers need to guard against. Forget about unbelievers. We believers need to guard against this. Covetousness is basically an, insati- it's, it's an unsatisfactory desire to find meaning and purpose in things other than God. It is a feeling and of wanting more and more and never being content with enough. So it's not settling for less. It's having enough but not being content with enough. Oh, you are the first black man to make a million at the age of 27. Ah, now I want to be the first black man to make a billion at the age of 30. Ah, now I want to make a zillion. Ah, never enough. Why are you doing that? Not because it's something you want to do for a reason. It's because you want to be acknowledged by people as great. That's what's driving you. That is covetousness. Another word to use to describe it very simply, greed. Greed. And Jesus has a lot to say about it. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 21. Look what the Bible says. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, he said to him, Who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over you? He then told them, Watch out. Watch out of all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possession. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? So he has more than enough. I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger barns and store all my grain and my goods inside the barn. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. God is not against riches. It's when riches occupies your heart more than God. That's the problem. And God is saying this is what he will do to the person who focuses on riches more than their focus on God. And what did God do to this man? He took him home early. Very sobering thoughts. And God can make sovereign decisions like that. God can say you're going to live 80 years, but the way you live your life can make God say it's 40 years. It's scary, but we must understand this is, what, how, this is the God that we serve. And guess what? He's not going to call you to a meeting and say, I'm thinking of... <laughs> That's what makes it even more scary. If there was a consultation, at least you could change your ways. But he has different ways of warning us without ex- saying exactly what he's thinking of doing. This man probably had 30, 40 years to live. But because of his covetousness, God took him home. Well, not even home. He went to hell. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10 to 11. Thieves, greedy people, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will, inherit, will not inherit God's kingdom. Some of you were like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So he was saying, before we were saved, some of us were like, we're greedy, swindlers, and all this manner of things. But because we are saved, we are no longer like this. But those who continue practicing such will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's talking to believers. In this text here, he's talking to not, not unbelievers, to believers. So we believers must guard against greed. You might be Holy Spirit filled, sanctified, born again, speaking in tongues, but if you're living a life of greed or you're harboring greed, I'm sorry to say, don't be surprised if you end up in hell. It's, 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 it's a, I can't make it as, I, can't, I don't know how else to stay it. If you're entertaining greed in your life as a believer, I'm sorry to say, but you are on your way to hell, even though you're praising the Lord. 
It's very clear scripture. Thieves, greedy people, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Will not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither in this life or the next. So, what can we do then in view of all of this to develop a biblical worldview? 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due season. God has a season to exalt, uh, exalt you and I, just like he has a season to judge the world. He has a season. Your frustration might be because it is not your season, and you're trying to make it happen. And sometimes it is your season, but you're not doing enough to make it happen. How do I know when it's my season and make it happen? And how do I know when it's not my season and chill? It's called discernment. About the, the sons of Essachar, they understood the seasons. If the sons of Essachar could understand the season they're in, you with the Holy Spirit living inside of you, why shouldn't you understand the season? The only thing that can stop you from understanding the season you're in is if you keep on holding on to an earthly worldview. Oh, my friend, same age as me. She's married already. My friend, same age as me, bought a house already. Why? What about me? Earthly worldview. It might not be your age, not what determines is your season. Moses was 80 before he started his ministry, 80 years old. But that was his season. 80 years old before he started his ministry. So you don't get to decide your, ministry, your, your, your season based on age or based on comparison with your neighbor. Lastly, what can we do to develop an earthly worldview? Psalm 119, verse 130. With pride, get rid of pride, humble yourself, and let's see the next thing. The revelation of your word brings light and gives understanding to the in experience, I love that. I've never seen that version before. Very good. Another translation says, the entrance of your word gives light, revelation, and understanding, illumination to the simple. Not to everybody. Who are the simple? Those with a humble heart. So developing a worldview starts with making a commitment to resist pride. Just like God resists pride in any shape or form, and to embrace the spirit of humility. You might be the most beautiful woman in the world, the most handsome man in the world, the richest man in the world. Never forget you enjoy those privileges, not because you're special, but because God ordained it to be so. Everything we have good in this life, it is because God gave it to you. The Bible says all good things come from God. And the moment you take your eyes off that, pride will come in. And the only thing pride does is bring you down. And that will not be our story. That will not be our portion. In the mighty name of Jesus, shall we stand? I'd like to invite Elizabeth to the front. You are worthy of our prayer. Oh, 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 you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our praise. Oh, 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 you are worthy of Jesus, Jesus, you are worthy of our prayer. Oh, you are worthy of our prayer. Yahweh, you are worthy of. Oh, you are worthy of. I just want us just to take a few moments as we have heard the word today. I believe he has encouraged us. I want us just to take a few moments today and just to ask the Lord for the grace. Ask the Lord for what it means to truly humble ourselves in his presence. What it truly means to humble ourselves in how we handle situations and how we see situations. You know, so interesting. I was even aligning it to Joshua chapter 2, where 
Rahab tells the people about who God is. And we look at what happened to the kings, what happened to King Ty, then the king of Ty, what happened to the devil, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, thank God. There was even grace at the end of his one. You know, his one was not forever. His one was for seven years, not forever. May our story not be like any of these. The king of Ty, may our story not be like Satan's. May our story not be like Nebuchadnezzar's. Even his that was limited. We don't even want to even venture anywhere close to his. And it's because of humility. So I just want us just to pray today for God to give us the grace and the understanding, the wisdom. You know, when you hear a scripture that from 1 Peter chapter 5 about humbling ourselves before God, you know, sometimes when you hear that scripture, you might not even understand where it comes in or where it comes to play. But when God starts to speak to you, anytime I want to change in my life, I always go to that scripture because I believe things go in seasons. So I want to change in my life. And perhaps it's a change that in the physical realm should naturally be mine. You know, if I do these exams or if I apply for this job, then I'm going to get 100 percent. But every, you know, every time after a few years, I've learned to come to that scripture. If I want to change my season, I need to align myself with God to make sure that my season changes when he wants it to change. So like Pastor Shea said, he said something really crucial that if there's something you're waiting for, you're not getting it. Is it possible? Is it possible that it's not the time yet? So therefore you have to be patient. And you know, when you humble yourself before the Lord, the humility process is a posture of rest. It's a posture of peace. Because once you know that in due season, God will exalt you. God will exalt you. So what is it that you are waiting for God for? What is it that you're believing God for that you need to humble yourself before him? And how do we see the humility that comes out in the life of Nebuchadnezzar? We see him addressing God and understanding God is the God of the universe. Addressing God that God is the one who gives all things, all authority, all possessions, all realities comes from God. So I want to pray, I want you guys to pray for yourself this afternoon. God, give me the grace, give me the understanding, give me the wisdom to understand how I should be humbling myself in my life. Help me to be able to see how I can do that walk of humility in my life. Let, let it not be said of me that I am like these people. Let it be said of me that indeed I am humble before you. Father, I surrender to you. I submit everything to you. My mindset, my way of thinking, my worldview. I submit it to you, Lord. Father, I'm willing to, to wait, to wait and be patient, Lord. I'm willing to be patient, Father, in your presence. The second thing Pastor Shea said was about greed and covetousness. And, you know, part of all of that sometimes, you have said it before, it's about comparison. You know, there's, there's a lot of, when I'm looking at myself and I'm describing myself in a certain way, whatever it is, is my vision of, um, well, you know, I've arrived, you know, my vision of arrival, that, um, that person, you, um, the person Jesus Christ was talking about in the story, the man who said, you know, I've got all of these things, how I need to build more to be able to look at all my wealth, that vision of arrival. And it's so subtle, it's so small, it's so tiny. But the root of it, again, is still that pride. And again, we're seeing Nebuchadnezzar as well in his mindset in terms of he just looked out to his kingdom. Woo, look, look at all of this again. That element of this is what I've achieved. Look what I've accomplished. And if we're not careful, we keep wanting to achieve more and accomplish more and accomplish more. We compare ourselves to other people. That person has got it. So I've got to have it too. So I want us to again to pray to the Lord for the grace to see where we might be coveting in our hearts. Where part of the challenges we're going through, part of the issues we're going through in our minds, part of what's making us not go to sleep at night comfortably might be because we are in a rush because we want to be able to achieve something at a certain time. Whether or not enough is not enough. You know, Philippians chapter 4 where it talks about we should be content in all things and we are to be content in all things. Paul said, I have learned how to live when there is little and when there is much. And then when he says then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, it's from a continuation of the fact that he is now content in every situation. In due season, God will exalt you, but while you're in each season, why don't you just rest? God will exalt you anyway, but while you're waiting, why don't we just rest? Why don't we just be at peace? Why don't we just be at 
in that place of trust. So let's pray this afternoon, Father, for anywhere where I might be coveting, Father, anywhere where I might be operating from a place of greed, anywhere I might be operating from a place of I have arrived, look what I'm going to do next, look at the next thing I'm going to achieve, Father, please reveal it to us, let us see it, Lord. Father, because sometimes we might not be able to see it. It's not because we want to do these things. It's because we don't know. Father, give us the understanding. Give us the insight. The interest of your word indeed gives light. Father, we pray that you will shine your light of illumination onto our hearts. Let us see it in ourselves, Lord. And Father, we pray for the grace to be able to stop and to be able to repent and turn away. And look at how... They did it. It was about praising the Most High God and giving honor to God, making sure that God never tips off from that place of authority, that place of, um, of he never tips off the throne of your life, that God is never off the throne of your life, that it's always going to be God at the top of your life. I want us to pray this afternoon, Lord Father, I surrender to you that, Father, you will always be at the top of my life. You will always be the main, the only, the one, the first of my life. Father, I will always trust you. And let me tell you, the process of trust takes time. It's easy for me to say in due season, because you might be like, but I've already been waiting for quite a while. And of course, the problem is that because it says due season, you might be saying, yeah, but according to my age, my race, my this, my blah, it should, I'm overdue. <laughs> but I want to encourage you that due season might be from God's perspective because it's due season from God's perspective. And be rest assured, if you can humble yourself in his presence, God will give you peace. God will give you a sense of understanding that even you cannot create for yourself. It says that his peace surpasses all understanding. God will give you a sense of assurance that even you cannot comprehend. God will give you assurance. He will give you his word. He will give you confirmation. He will give you affirmations. You know, people like to write affirmations. God gives you affirmations. God says to Joshua in Joshua 1, be strong, be courageous. I have sent you out. God speaks to you. God reassures you. God affirms you. God confirms you. If you're in that place of humility in his presence, to trust him, trust him, trust him in this season. So, Father, as we have heard your word today, Father, we pray that it shall not condemn, condemn us, Lord. We ask for forgiveness of sins where we have walked in greed, where we have walked in covetousness, where we have walked in pride against you, Lord. And we just want to pray, Almighty God, that you will open up the eyes of our hearts to see how this is operating in us. Father, we know that, yes, when we were once sinners, we behaved this way. But, Father, now we are in Christ Jesus through the renewing of our minds, through the word that we're hearing today. We are happy to change our minds and allow our minds and our hearts to be transformed by you. Father, we want to come before you. and We want to submit to you, Father, that you shall humble us, Lord. And we will humble ourselves before you, Father, for every single situation we might be facing right now for everything that we might be waiting for, for everything that we might be desiring for, even all the things that we have, Father, we will not place our identity upon any worldly possession, no matter how good, how wonderful, how strong it is, even if it's relationships, we will not place our worldly, um, our sense of identity, Lord, on any title, any accomplishment we'll have, but instead, Father, we think Thank you for all of it, Lord. We praise you because you're the one who gives us the seasons that we have. Everything that is of joy in our lives, Father, you are the one who has given it to us. So we praise you. We cherish you, Lord, Father, for you are a good Father who gives us good and perfect gifts. We thank you, Lord, for every wonderful relationship, every successful relationship that we have, Lord. Father, we thank you for every provision that you have given us, Father. Every bill that you have helped us to pay, Father, we are grateful. For the jobs that we have, Lord, Father, we are thankful, we are grateful. For every asset that you have given us, Father, we are thankful. For every bright idea that we have, Lord, Father, we are thankful. Almighty God, for every business that we have started, 
every idea that you've allowed us to be able to create from idea form into a physical thing, a meeting, a, a plan, something. Father, we are thankful for everything that you have given us that has given us profit. Father, we are thankful. Father, we are grateful for every talent, every natural talent, everything that comes easily to us, public speaking, playing an instrument, singing a song, writing, everything that we have taken for granted, but it is you that has given it to us. Father, we are thankful for everything, Lord, that you have given to us, Lord Father. We are thankful because you are the creator of the universe. You are the creator of the heavens. You are the creator of the earth. You are the creator of us. And Father, we want to humble ourselves before you this afternoon, Lord Father. And for the things that are imperfect, Father, we want to submit them into your presence, Lord. And we thank you because we know in due season, in every single scripture that we have heard today, your words came true. It came true in the life of Satan. We can see it. It came true in the life of the king of Ty. It came true in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. Father, in the lives of the children of Israel with Joshua and Rahab, your word will come true. Father, in our lives, may your words come true in the mighty name of Jesus. May your promises come true in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray for everyone who is in this room or everyone who's listening, everyone who's watching, Lord Father, that needs that reassurance. Father, I pray like King Nebuchadnezzar heard a voice from heaven. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will speak to your people so that they can hear your voice. They can hear your assurance. They can hear your promise, Lord, and it will do land in their hearts their soft, tender hearts, willing to hear you, Lord, and they will believe, they will hold on, and they will not be discouraged in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. I want to encourage us to bring our tithes and our offerings into the presence of the Lord. For those who are joining us online, we want to encourage you to do so through the online portal. And as we leave that on for a few moments, I just want us to be encouraged to make sure that during the week, all the sessions that we're having during the week, we have our Monday prayer at 9 p.m. We have our Thursday Bible study at 7 p.m. on Zoom. We want to encourage you to make sure that you are joining us every single week for these sessions on Thursday. We'll be talking about what has been shared today in the service. I feel like there's lots of things that I'm sure we can all draw out from today's uh, message. So make sure you're with us on Thursday. I want to encourage you as well, especially for those who are watching us online, for every single Sunday, be live with us. There is space. We want to make sure that you come into the service every Sunday with us at 11 a.m. at Trinity at Bowles Methodist Church, Palmerston Road in Palmer's Green Enfield. We want to make sure that you're live with us. There is something different about being live in the presence of the Lord. I welcome Pastor Shea just to lead us in the confession as we close the service. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay, so let's go to our confession. On the count of three, one, two, three. For just as the rain and snow falls from heaven and does not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so will the words that come from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. You, I will indeed go out with joy and be peacefully guided. The mountains and the hills will break into singing before me, or the trees of the field will clap their hands for me. Instead of the thorn bush, a cypress will come up, and instead of the brow, a mitre will come up. It will make a name for the Lord as an everlasting sign that will not be destroyed. I overcome Satan when I testify personally what the word of God tells me the blood of Jesus has done for me. I refuse to yield my members, which is my body, and I also refuse to yield my soul to the devil as an instrument of unrighteousness. Instead, I will yield my body and my soul as an instrument of righteousness. So help me, God. Father, we thank you for such a time that we've had. We thank you, Lord, for your promises are yes and amen. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible says we should not be hearers of the word only and deceive ourselves, but we need to be doers of the word. Lord, the grace to do your word, help us, enable us, empower us with those grace. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, and welcome to My Identity in Christ Church. 
Our church vision is to establish Christ at the center of people's lives. We will accomplish this goal through our church mission initiatives, which is to teach people how to discover their purpose and fulfill it. Discover their identity in Christ and embrace it. Build godly relationships and marriages that glorify God on the earth. This is what success looks like to us. Seeing people walking in their identity, seeing people living a life of purpose, having Christ-centered relationships. This is what success looks like to us. We see a church that helps you to be more Christ-like at work. We see a church that helps you to be more Christ-like in your families. We see a church that teaches you, disciples you on how to develop a closer intimacy with God. We see a church that helps you and encourages you to develop your gifts and talents. Our goal as a church is to have impacted the lives of one million people by the 31st of December 2030. My identity in Christ Church is not just a place where people gather. This is a church that's on the move to disciple people and see Jesus Christ at the center of everything they do and experience in their lives. For more information and on how you can be part of this vision, please feel free to leave a message with the church team. Welcome to my identity in Christ Church.